Um, all right, so uh, thank you very much for attending my talk. Um, so um, in this talk, I'm going to discuss how we actually empower reverse engineering using the latest techniques in machine learning as well as data mining. So the overall process, the overall process that we try to optimize about binary and is about binary analysis or program analysis. So we start with uh, typically we start with a binary file, which is a sequence of 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. And then we have a disassembler. We can get a list of assembly functions. And each function basically is like a list of uh, assembly instructions. And then here is our reverse engineering fellow. And um, he or she will try to do a manual analysis task to take a look at the functionality or high, uh, abstract high level logics of the assembly functions. And depending on what kind of task, such as the malware analysis or vulnerability analysis, so, so they, are different, uh, they, they have different purpose here. But the overall process, this is the overall simplified process of uh, the workflow, the reverse engineer workflow that we try to optimize. Of course, we have uh, different kind of techniques that here and there helping out this process as well. But we really focus on the last steps here for reverse engineering by trying to answer two specific questions. So um, when a reverse engineer try to understand a specific functions, well, we try to address the information need, information need of the reverse engineering task. Is this something that has been analyzed before by himself or herself or it is something that uh, has been analyzed just a couple seconds ago uh, by his or her teammates, or it's just a known library functions or a variation of the known library functions. We try to address this information needs, their information needs by using an info re information retrieval approach. So um, we develop an open source uh, assembly called Chrome Search Engine, Camino, and so suppose it's like a um, centralized repository of uh, assembly language that uh, people can build different repositories, just like on GitHub, instead of a repository of source code, they create a repository of assembly code depending on the task that they are working on. And then the reverse engineers as a team or within organizations, so they can um, index um, the uh, assembly functions that they're analyzing and they can search for the clones as well. So by using um, this high level system, we try to address the information needs uh, for the reverse engineering. But um, when we talk about information retrieval, we need to define what is, exact, what is exactly similarity, right? What is exactly is the clone? So in the literature, so in the literature of um, assembly, uh, assembly language clone search, um, so there are typically three different types of clones. So the first type of clone is an exact clone, right? So there's nothing fancy here. They are exactly the same. So to find this kind of clone, we can simply do uh, exact hashing, right? And the second type of clone is that is called a syntactically equivalent. So these two pieces of um, assembly code looks uh, different, but they are actually corresponding to the same logics, but maybe due to different uh, compilers or different versions of the compiler, they use different register or different offsets on the stack to represent different variable. So after normalizing the assembly code, uh, or normalizing the instructions and variable into their abstract high level token representation, they are actually the same, just like two minifigures here is that the, the, the picture is taken from different angle, that's why they are different, but if we normalize the camera, they will be the same. So this kind of uh, clone set is not difficult to handle as well. And the third type of clone is the minor modification. So for minor modification means that we allow a certain degree of uh, update or change to the, clone, uh, to the assembly code. Um, so this, this can be done through any like fuzzy, fuzzy hashing or locality sensor hashing algorithms um, for nearest neighbor clone search. But um, more uh, what is more challenging is that we also have different kind of obfuscation as well as optimization techniques that make the same assembly functions that look completely different. So for example, in this case, suppose this, the minifigures that um, on the left hand side is um, the original one. We can break it into different parts, reorganize it, and even inject different noise to it. So the image here looks very different. So how does this translate to a real life scenario? So here we have four 
different assembly functions. They are actually come from the, source, the same source code. So the, the one that on the left is the original one that without any optimization. And then the second one is the with the, um, all the optimizations turns on. And the third one is obfuscated by the um, control flow graph flat, uh, flattening techniques in the OLLVM. So all the base blocks are break into different parts and, um, and duplicated and arranged by a big switch, gigantic switch. And the last one is obfuscated by the uh, bogus control flow. So because we are trying to do a search engines, right? So to find this kind of clone, we can, one possible way is that to do dynamic analysis, right? We can run the program because they're the same thing, so should expect the same input and output behavior. But as a search engine, we, we cannot really able to afford the luxury of uh, dy dynamic analysis. So we don't want the user to wait for, let's say, 10 minutes to, to, for, the, for the query to, to dynamically execute it or, or uh, symbolically execute it. So uh, we look into the existing literature or existing methods um, to statically model the assembly code. So we identify two main challenge or problems. So uh, typically when we try to model the assembly code, um, the relationships among the tokens that's within the assembly code is, is, is um, mostly uh, neglected. So for example, we have XMM zero register versus the other streaming, the streaming operations. They're not exactly the same, but I mean, they, they, um, on high level, they, they, they focus on the same aspect of the assembly instructions. Or F close and I versus F opens, they're different, but they kind of corresponding both to the file operations. And string compare and mem compare, um, string copy and memory copy, sometimes they are swappable, right? And the second challenge, the second problem is that it's about how we weight this information. So as an re experienced reverse engineer, you may not actually read every single line of assembly, like assembly instructions when you try to analyze something, right? So reverse engineering look for something interesting. So uh, we put higher weight on something that we never saw before that violate uh, what, we commonly know, what we commonly know. And regular random re repeated, pattern, uh, repeated patterns are not interesting, so we want to put a lower weight on that. So these two problems are actually quite similar to the problems in natural language processing uh, using machine learning. So um, actually what we're trying to do is that, well, we try to build a a new network to help us to address these two challenges. But before we jump into how we build this new network for assembly language, I want to talk about how I learn, learn English. As most of you can already tell, so I, I'm not a native English speaker, so my first language is not English. The way that um, I was, uh, the way that I learned English is that uh, it's quite brutal. We do a lot of multiple choice correction in exams. They're trying to complete a sentence with different options, right? So to find the right word to fit, fit into the um, context or the, the syntax of the sentence, right? So this is how I did before, and it turns out okay, so I can speak English right now. Um, and 10 years later, uh, people find out that this is a fantastic way to, tra to train a new network, to learn human language. So um, given the new network, so we asked the new network to solve um, millions of these kind of multiple choice questions following the same way. So in this case, first, we need to have the questions, right? So let's say if I have some text, um, a sequence of text that gets set on the map. So we apply a sliding window on the text and ask the neural network to predict what is in the middle, which is set given the context. So you can see here, uh, the input is the cat on, uh, and the output is set, right? So we want the neural network to, to make these kind of predictions over all the questions. And this approach turned out to be great. Uh, we can learn actually very rich semantic relationship between tokens. Uh, from the natural language. So you can see that um, one typical example is that the representation of king minus man plus woman actually is queen, and the bad minus good, and it's um, maniacal killer, and we, we, it, um, it actually kind of makes sense, right? And the pair of graph vectors here actually can capture what is unique about this question. Suppose you always said the cat sit on the mat, the cat sit on the mat, but one time I told you that you make a you make a wrong answer, uh, the right answer is not set, is speaking, 
And then you'll be okay. So uh, the exam that I took last week actually has a very weird, correct answer that is not said is, is, is about speaking, right? So this information is captured on the paragraph ID, which is like the exam ID, right? So you, you record it in a specific exam, there's a weird answer. Well, we're following the same way, applying this model, and uh, directory on the assembly code, it works great, but the problem is that assembly language is not like text, it's that linear layout, right? So um, we, we adopt this model a little bit. So um, instead of asking the model to predict what is in, in the middle of the token, we ask the model to reconstruct the, the instruction, the assembly instruction in the middle by considering the neighborhood instructions, right? So given a sliding window over the assembly instructions, let's say a size of three, I ask the model to predict, reconstruct what is in the middle uh, by taking the context, the neighbor instruction into consideration. And um, this, this model, it turns out, um, it works pretty well on assembly language, and by visualizing the uh, relationship among the um, assembly token, the tokens that we saw on assembly language is quite interesting. So we, we, we can see that uh, on the vector space, uh, 60 bits register. So the register pretty much group into different bit lengths. They, they kind of be similar to each other considering their context. And then the drum operations are grouped together. Are grouped together. We also have the condition, condition operations that group, to, uh, group it together. And if you look into the function course, the C library, C, uh, the libc function course inside the code, uh, we can also find that five operations are grouped together, as well as uh, the uh, networking and access control uh, functions are very similar to each other. So these are the, the, the token the, under the core instruction, right? After the, to after the core uh, instruction. So also we have the memory operations that tend to be grouped it, uh, together, as well as string search, and uh, for all the math-related uh, function calls are also grouped together, but that is not shown in this uh, slide. And we conduct the clone search evaluations by comparing um, the original binary against uh, the optimized one, and then we compare our approach with uh, all different kinds of a static approach, including grab based assembly code, like assembly language based, as well as two most recent uh, dynamic analysis based approach. It turns out that our approach is pretty accurate in matching between the original one as well as the optimized one, even compared to the um, some uh, recent um, dynamic approach, but we don't have enough samples to make a conclusion that is a, significant, a, st is a statistically significant um, difference. And then we also conduct the uh, Chrome search analysis using the uh, OLLVM obfuscator. It's not the best out there, but it, makes, it already makes the assembly code uh, looks very different. And it also turns out that our approach uh, performs very well uh, on this um, uh, on this, for this obfuscator. We also conduct case studies on uh, vulnerability retrieval data sets. It's like, it's like you have a repository of different assembly functions. Some of them are vulnerabilities. We try to retrieve them. And compared to ESH, which, it, which relies on dynamic analysis, our, appro our approach without any modification actually have a zero false positive. And as a static approach, it takes only a couple millisec uh, like a couple hundred or milliseconds to get the results. And we take another extreme, we use the Tigress um, obfuscator, which relying on virtualizations, uh, just in time executions to obfuscate the um, assembly language, assembly code. And um, so for the uh, in code retro obfuscation, well, it performs great. For virtualization, we can still recover some of the vulnerabilities. For JAT execution, well, still recover some of them, but if we apply all of them, like it's, you, you apply the uh, inquiry tool and then virtualization, and then you we apply the uh, JIT execution. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot recover anything because it looks already very, very difficult, uh, different. So uh, for this model, um, for this approach, uh, we developed to to push the boundary of static analysis against co-obfuscation and optimization. So it even perform some up somewhat better than the recent dynamic approach. Um, as a static approach, efficient, scalable, we can just use it for our search engines. And, but the problem is that, well, when we present a Chrome, because it's a vector representation, right? It's very difficult to explain to the end user, to the reverse engineer, that why exactly these two functions are considered as a Chrome, unlike in the other uh, subgraph-based Chrome search method. But uh, I mean, after ob obfuscation, 
the graph boundary is uh, is broken anyway, so so the subgraph, the concept of a subgraph is is no longer valid. Um, static approach, uh, of course, has some inherent um, disadvantage. So there's no, uh, um, it cannot recognize, for example, the dynamic jump table. And we also assume the assembly code coming from the same family. So we are talking from uh, searching English against English, but not English against French, right? So it's not like uh, x86 uh, against the ARM code. And actually, we put um, this uh, model as part of our uh, Camino binary analysis platform. So it's on GitHub, it's open source, it's ready to use. It can be deployed on your laptop and workstation, or you can deploy it on the cloud services, uh, rely on Spark. Um, so it's ready to use. Besides of ASM2 Web, which focuses on optimization and obfuscation, we also have ASM Chrome, which is the typical subgraph Chrome approach, Chrome search approach that given the query, given a target, we can identify the Chrome this subgraph. It's like really showing the reverse engineering, which part of the function is a Chrome to another function. And uh, we also have a Semino module, which uh, search for the clocks across uh, cross architecture. Uh, assembly instructions, so you can search x86 against an ARM code. So the, uh, this approach actually we rely on the intermediate representation for the code matching. And uh, this is also following a subgraph Chrome search approach, so it has a very good uh, degree of interpretability for search engines. Um, so that's it, okay, so any questions? Any questions from the audience? Uh, please come to the microphone, and uh, uh, before you ask questions, please state your name and affiliation, please. Thanks. Hi, Tessang Lee from IBM. Hi. Um, I'm not sure if you uh, had any discussion about uh, different architectures, I mean, different neural network architectures. Uh, for higher level uh, languages, like Java, I think uh, people have used LSTMs or CNNs, and all, actually CNN has been also used for binary. So have you compared them with uh, this uh, CBO structure? Um, so, so the reason why we use a more simpler architecture is that we want a through, like a higher throughput rate of the um, of the um, of the um, of the training model because we want the model to learn as much as from the data. So uh, that's why we didn't rely on LSTM. So another reason why we don't use LSTM is that we observe that when we increase increase the context. The, the, the larger the context we increase, um, the, the, the higher chance that you can actually just directly predict out the uh, assembly instruction that um, as our target, um, and it will have less information propagate back to the exam ID that we can remember, oh, I make, it's like make the question extremely difficult for the model. So instead we make a lot of uh, simple questions uh, to the uh, model. So actually we did try our LSTM on our own, but um, the performance is not very good because the throughput rate is very small, yeah, compared to. Um, right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, uh, due to the time limit, we may only take one question for this, uh, this talk, so let's thank Stephen one more time. Okay, thank you.